snapshots of everyday life in Parisian streets and cafes, and behind the scenes at the ballet, were new and daring, far beyond the posed portraits that had come before. I absolutely love this because instead of the male gaze, this is the woman with field glasses looking straight at Degas as he paints her. So she sees him in close up. So why do you think he bought something like this? This is extraordinary, it's so striking. Well, as far as we know, this is one of the very first works that he buys. We know he had this by 1902. It would seem to me that, because he, he was buying it early, that without realising it, he was collecting something that was actually almost subversive and certainly quite provocative. By good judgment and luck, William Burrell amassed no fewer than 22 works by the artist, building up the largest and finest collection of Degas anywhere in the UK. Why was Glasgow such a vibrant uh, scene for art at the end of the 1800s? Well, I think it's a combination of three things. Um, first of all, there was a lot of money around, mm. uh, and that's very important for artists because there were people to support them. Um, the second thing is that there were um, these dealers, these art agents who were able to act as a, a kind of interface between the artist and the collector. And of course, the third thing is that there were, the, there were these men who were very anxious to buy paintings. Burrell's newfound wealth made him a leading player in this art market. Was he, do you think, from an early age, a very astute businessman? Very. Absolutely ruthless in his ship owning because he used to wait until the shipyards were crying out for work and he'd order a whole lot of ships at once and get them very cheap. And then he used to sell when there was a boom and this is how he made money. Between 1898 and 1900, just two years, as demand for ships peaked and prices rose, Burrell sold his entire fleet. His bold strategy reaped him huge financial rewards. By the turn of the century, Burrell's business acumen had amassed him his first fortune. Now he could step back from shipping and concentrate on building his collection. And that moment coincided with one of the most fabulous events in Glasgow's cultural history, the 1901 International Exhibition here in Kelvin Grove Park. And Burrell put himself at the heart of it. He had been collecting for more than 20 years, but Burrell had never put his impressive collection on public display. Now the time was right, as people flocked to the Glasgow exhibition from all over the country to see the latest advances in industry and in art. And when he lent the exhibition more than 200 works, Willie Burrell announced himself as an international collector of note. It's the first time I've got a real picture of the breadth of his collection. He has some Manets and also he has some Glasgow items, but the surprise is where the medieval items. There were tapestries there. Um, how he acquired them, nobody knows. So it's the breadth of the collection that's there that's really interesting. Burrell had an international ambition, didn't he? Yes, he did. And I think really the people he was looking at were the Americans. And they're the big collectors. You've got You've got the Rockefellers, you've got J. Poppett Morgan, and Frick, and then latterly, of course, Randolph Hearst. In the middle of the 19th century, some of the richest men in America began spending unimaginable fortunes on art and antiquities. Coke and steel tycoon Henry Clay Frick bought many of Europe's finest old masters. And later, newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst for everything from Greek vases to Spanish furniture. They wanted to furnish their grand mansions and castles as a mark of their status. In a sense, Burrell belongs to that kind of 
I'm rather, Duveen rather unkindly called the robber barons, but those people who are really self-made people coming up and buying collections, forming their identity with these great collections. And all these industrials were also showing that they were cultured too. It wasn't just about blood and guts and steel. Oh, absolutely not. I think that's absolutely, that's absolutely right. This was collecting of a high order. We don't know exactly where Burroughs started collecting medieval art. He may have picked up his taste on family holidays to Holland and France, perhaps encouraged by his mother, who also fancied herself a collector. But over six decades, Burl assembled one of the finest collections of Northern European medieval, Gothic and early Renaissance art ever amassed by one man. OK, Kelly. Yeah. And you've got enough manoeuvring space to do that, otherwise I would go in the middle now. These 14th century stained glass panels from a Carmelite monastery in Boppard on Rhine in Germany survived iconoclasm and the Napoleonic Wars and are also some of the most beautiful glass Burrow collected. They've been up on display since the museum opened and now need to come down for conservation. There's always an unknown quantity to it, and I suppose until you've done it, you never know. So we always have a contingency plan. So what's the worst that could happen? Well, I suppose the worst that could happen would be that it slips and falls. OK, I've got all of this. It's coming down. It'll be really exciting to see them in the workshop and start exploring what went on with them before they went on display here at the Burrow. OK. In a lifetime of collecting, William Burrell steadily put together one of the finest and most comprehensive collections of stained glass in the world. What were some of his best bargains? The Falsley Hall glass, this wonderful series of heraldic panels, early 16th century one family from this early 16th century house in Northamptonshire. He pursues them long and hard from before the war till after the war and gets them really quite cheaply. And there's things like the Prophet Jeremiah from Saint Denis, which he pays £114 for. It's from the first Gothic church built by Ab Abbot Suger, you know, this great figure in 12th century French society. And it's one of the windows there. And of course, at the time, nobody knew it came from there. So that was an amazing bargain. You can point to the collection and find all sorts of things he actually bought really rather well. William Burrell taught himself about every aspect of his collection and as his knowledge and his contacts book grew, he was able to buy better and better. He started with a very curious mind as a child and he never stopped. He was always asking dealers and finding out about different things. And he was really, really interested in, in their provenance and where they'd come from and what they meant. Burrell sought out a handful of exceptional objects with royal connections. One piece on display bore witness to a fateful night in English history. When I first came to the Burrell Collection, it was down in the store. And I found it, and I looked at it, and I thought, what is this? <laughs> and it turns out to be the matrimonial bedhead that was made for the ill-fated marriage of Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves. So they would have slept in this on their wedding night? Yes. It's political and also slightly erotic. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, a rare combination, shall we say. Interesting saying. combination. Interesting. Um, so in the centre here, we've got an inscription that actually states exactly who Henry is. King of England and of France, Lord of Ireland, and the chief and supreme head of the Church of all England. So that's the political bit. That's the political What's bit. What's the erotic bit? Well, if you look at the carving, we've got a grown-up woman on this side and a man on your side. Well, he, they, a very prominent codpiece. He's got a very prominent codpiece. And what's he got um, on his Which left was fashionable hand? at the time. <laughs> um, he's holding a large fruit, emphasising the fruitfulness of the union. And on this side, um, we've got a very fashionably dressed lady. 
In one hand, she's got a serpent or a snake, and in her other hand, in her right hand, she's holding an upturned sword. So, as I usually say to the guides here, interpret as desired <laughs> for that. So that, um, of course, is the idea it's that it's It's the idea of virility. And of course, this is not a rendition of Anne of Cleves. Oh, she was no, rather no, not a very yes. attractive person. <laughs> well, some of the stories are that they played cards all night. Um, we don't know if that's true. We'll never know. Only the bedhead knows. And I find that really exciting that this bedhead was actually there on that night. With objects like the king's bedhead, Burrell bought his own piece of royal history. But he was just as interested in precious things used by ordinary people. Religious sculptures like these served to remind illiterate churchgoers of their Bible stories and were carved from English alabaster in the 14th century. Burrell also got his hands on some even rarer alabasters designed as prayer objects for the home. There are others in other museums, but this is something which most museums in the world would Kill for. give anything for. Yeah. This is the head of St. John the Baptist, after he was beheaded, being carried on a platter. Mm -hmm. At the top, we've got the soul being carried to heaven by angels. And below, we've got the resurrecting Christ coming out of the mm -hmm. tomb. So it's a very Catholic image. Mm -hmm. And after the Reformation, it would be very dangerous indeed to be found with something like this in your home. Burrell collected a royal flush of medieval artefacts, from precious glass to sculpture and textiles, and intricately woven tapestries, which had always conferred status in society. Perhaps that was why Burrell liked these best of all. Yes, he actually says in some of his correspondence that he thinks tapestries are possibly the most important part of his collection in his own view. And this is an allegory Charity overcoming envy, so charity being a virtue, is attacking envy, who is one of the vices. She's obviously managing very well. She is managing very well indeed. She's um, holding a sword and she's just about to strike him down. This tapestry is about 500 years old and it was made in the area that nowadays we call the Southern Netherlands, which was one of the most important um, tapestry weaving centres in the known world at the time. Burrell collected more than 200 important tapestries, ranging from the allegorical to the heraldic and the playful. I, I really don't know where to begin with this tapestry. There is just so much to see, and it just looks so glorious. Yeah, and it's actually one of our favourites, and especially the school parties that come in absolutely love this tapestry. This is called Preparing to Hunt Rabbits with Ferrets. Mm -hmm. Is it meant to be fun? Are you meant to be looking for things? Because I'm seeing things all the time that I perhaps didn't see two or three minutes ago. I think it is meant to be fun. It's actually one of three tapestries from the same kind of series. Um, the other two are in San Francisco and in the Louvre in Paris. Although it looks quite simple to tapestry connoisseurs, this is actually the height of tapestry design. And that's because the figures are actually sort of jigsawed together mm. to fill the whole space. And I'm sure sitting here, there's lots of things I haven't seen yet. Yeah. The... As well as all the rabbit holes, you've got this this strange-looking bear. Yes, yeah. I mean, he had a good eye for tapestries. He knew what he wanted. And, and as I say, two connoisseurs, it is very special. What do you think sparks Burroughs' love of medieval art? Well, it's certainly not for their religious input. Uh, and I think the tapestries are, my, by and large, secular, and that shows that. But again, it's really sort of gothic he, he's really keen on. And probably the reason for that is that he likes 
the kind of objects, initially anyway, which will furnish the kind of house 